Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to. S- <laughs> you <laughs> That's awesome. Ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 19 of Brokers and Booze. I am Billy H. with Sands Realty. Cross. I'm Chris Ward, broker in charge of Eagle Realty. And I'm Nick Sowers, broker in charge of Beach Connection Realty. And today, part two, we got a special guest. I'll let him introduce himself again. Yeah, I'm, I'm Phil Treadwell. I'm the vice president of development and a regional manager for Mason McDuffie. I'm the host of the Mortgage Marketing Expert Podcast and co-founder of Industry Syndicate Podcast Network. So we are doing Mortgage March here on Brokers and Booze. Um, on the last episode, Phil told a lot about his past, so we're not going to go back through that again. Listen to the previous I was gonna episode. I you should go back and listen. So, <laughs> that's our advice to you also. But what we will do, we're going to change it up. We're going to drink uh, a little, taste a little vodka today. It's a Grey Goose. It's their top shelf. VX and VX stands for Vodka Exceptional. Mm-hmm. We were trying to figure out which Roman numeral that stood for. However, <laughs> don't rack your brains. It's Vodka Exceptional. <laughs> so. so, Bill, what is special about the Grey Goose VX? So, I've learned that this is actually ninety percent, ninety-five percent vodka, five percent cognac. Hmm. It's one of the coolest boxes I've ever seen. Really? Before. This bottle's not bad. The bottle's pretty cool. <laughs> so I got this. I actually won it at a golf tournament on some drawing. I was hammered, so I really don't remember. But Nick's, Nick's a scratch golfer, so. <laughs> <laughs> so he, I really don't remember really how I won it, like whether it was a shot or what, or it was just a drawing. Like, I don't know. It just got given to me. I was like, man. And I pulled it up. like, this is this looks like a nice bottle of vodka. So. Well, right. well, let's do well, a little cheers. Well, let's cheers. try it out. Yeah. It lives up. Mm. Wow. That is quite different. That's fact. good, actually. It, it definitely does have a flavor profile. Like The cognac takes the sharpness of the vodka off yeah, a little bit. Yeah. You know what, I, I'm not a big vodka on the rocks drinker, except for that uh, D. Gaia, Uka, whatever. The guy, Russia, wait a second. Russia. Wait a second. <laughs> He's oh, not a great vodka on the rocks drinker at the beginning of the night. <laughs> oh. Okay, let's say, because Bill's drinks, the water in them gets less and less as the night goes on. That's true. <laughs> yeah. I typically am not a vodka rocks Me guy, but I do like this because it's smooth. And typically, Grey Goose, you can drink it on the rocks with like a squeeze of lemon or something just to kind of take the edge off. But this doesn't even need that. This is pretty smooth. Yeah, because it almost has a little bit of citrus palate, like mm-hmm. already like mixed into it, whether that's a cognac or not. Uh, now it's not the water from the from the uka that we drank that a couple episodes dangerous. back. It just tastes like ice water. <laughs> oh, but talking about the wild duck. Yeah, the wild duck. Yeah, yeah the Russian. The yeah. Russian pronunciation. Where is where is this uka. from? Where's France. this from? France. Okay. France. Grey Goose is All French product. A little French product. Huh? Isn't it Grey Goose is from France? This is a, yeah. bo- a <laughs> booze <laughs> podcast. They know Grey France. Goose is from France. France. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, all, we're always learning, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> we're always learning. <laughs> and Google. <laughs> we don't assume our audience knows. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, Stoli, that's from Russia. Yes. Just oh, all right. <laughs> Stoli is <laughs> That makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Now, well, yep. Phil's joining us again. Uh, he was gracious enough to do a second episode, and this was your, your second drink of choice, I believe, that you sent. Us, so we're it trying did. to trying to yeah. honor that as well. Yeah. Um, hopefully, it was a it was a good it was a great choice. Yes, yes. thank you. I'm, I typically scotch is my first choice if uh, the location doesn't have great scotch. Uh, if they have the hot garbage that calls itself scotch, I, I switch to uh, vodka. There you go. And uh, so those are, those are my first two two choices. And for being a spirit kind of sewer himself, we actually found two. Spirits that he's never had before. Yeah, yeah. I'm very impressed. Yeah, and do yeah. we know? You said you won this at the golf tournament. Do we know kind of retail? On I, the- I, I mean, I pulled it up, looked on Google. It's eighty bucks, ninety bucks okay. for the for the seven hundred and fifty milliliter. Gotcha. Probably goes up if you want a bigger bottle. And- Nice. So nice. I like it that it says on the back instead of drink responsibly, it says sip responsibly. Sip, sip responsibly. responsibly. <laughs> so try it. Definitely a sipper, not a shooter. Yeah. Well, what's it say about it? Let's and see. You and you don't really need. Yeah, like I said, you don't really need a mixer on this one. I could. I could taste a little to. nut flavor at the end. Kind of a fish. really. No, well, it does. Cognac. Cognac's bringing that out, or it says it's um, orchard fruits, plum, apricot, okay. a little bit of wild honey. Wild honey. A little honey. Nutty and honey, honey. No nutty honey. Of boats on them. Yeah. <laughs> See, when I think cognac, I think old guys with cigars in a yeah. leather room. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> we, we have an interesting pairing. Yeah. We haven't broke out the cigars yet on Brokers and Booze. We talked about that for some episode in the future. Yeah, yeah. cigars well, and booze. 
<laughs> yeah, that's okay. That's what I remember. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah. All right. So, great looking box. Spots so. are behind us. That's right. That's right. Well, Grey Goose, if you want to send us any more to try, feel free. Send it to Dallas, Texas. I'm constantly <laughs> saying, you guys said send, send it to Myrtle Beach. Send it to Dallas. I'm con- constantly looking for the box. 6940 Myrtle Beach. Yeah. 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 Um, All right, so if you go back and definitely watch the first episode with Phil, he gave some great um, branding, marketing talk, uh, kind of what he does uh, as, as far as his background and what, what you get to do and traveling around talking with mortgage yeah. lenders and, and, and even related in real estate and mortgage industry and that kind of stuff. So we wanted to break out in this particular episode a little bit more macro high level mortgage industry as sure. a whole what is happening and where is it going really is, uh, is the main topic for this and I think show. I think there's a lot of headline news out there yeah um, you got you got big the big banks have always been in the mortgage company it's a natural extension now you have big real estate service providers I'm going to say the Zillow you have the franchises themselves Keller Williams and them have their own mortgage arms even the home builders now have their own mortgage arms so it's like where is it going are we all headed that direction are we all headed that like you know all the mortgages are going to eventually like the little guy don't stand a chance like (laughs) I don't think so I think because at the end of the day no matter whether you're on the real estate or mortgage side of, of the industry it, most consumers still want some type of a human interaction if for no other reason to make sure that they're not making the wrong decision. We second guess ourselves and those of us in the industry I think get jaded and forget that just because we do this every day, most people don't really understand the mortgage transaction, don't understand the home buying process. And so I think even though there's a lot of great technology platforms that make a lot of that process simple and efficient, I don't think you're ever going to be able to completely create technology enough to to replace the human being. And I know that there's a lot of fintech, financial technology companies that want to do that because there is some decent margin in a real estate transaction. You've got six to eight on the real estate side. You've got five to seven on the mortgage side. You've got one to three on the title side. By the time you add that together, if they can make a platform that encompasses all of that, there's some money to be made. But I think that companies that are pairing technology, the high tech, with the personal, the high touch, those are the ones that will continue to stay relevant uh, long term. I can say, I don't know about you guys, but as a real estate agent, um, I, I definitely want always want a mortgage lender that's a personal on the other side because I want somebody to yell at. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are times I want to be like, dude, what's going on? Like, yeah, we need like, to work out what companies you're working with. You're to yell too often. Yeah, I don't have to yell too often. No, well, when I'm the seller and I don't, it may not be a mortgage company has a relationship because the sure, buyer chose sure. whoever. Like, I tried calling Quicken once. That wasn't a fun time. I mean, but, but I always get frustrated at it's and for me and uh, you know over 17 years now. It's really the mortgage lender I'm yelling at, or at least if I am, it's only because I can't get a hold of an underwriter and I can't talk to a processor. Yeah. Like it's, it's, yeah. and it's, you know, they're the middle, the, the, the middle, you know, totally. gatekeeper and that kind of stuff. It's really not their fault, but they don't have any control in the process either. So, you know, is there ever going to be a, a, a time in the industry where, and I, and I guess I talk a little bit, this probably from more big bank, but it's like, you know, the lender, the processor, the underwriter, like different areas of the country even and they're like not and they like don't talk and they won't talk to each other and you can't really get you know as a real estate agent or that kind of stuff I can't talk with an underwriter a lot of times that it just seems so discombobulated as far as the process yeah goes. super fragmented um, but I also think that depends on the type of company mm-hmm. so let's just kind of dissect uh, on a macro view of mortgage you have the huge banks you know the Bank of America the Wells Fargo the, the ginormous lenders in the country then you have independent mortgage banks which are ones who they're uh, lending their own money the underwriters the processors the entire transaction is done in house they control that transaction but they may not service that loan long term they may sell to one of the big banks or they may sell to another servicing company. Then you have an individual mortgage broker. An individual mortgage broker is just a mortgage professional that's going to take an individual borrower and pair them up with what they think the the right lender might be. 
and brokers have resurged a lot over the last few years as rates have lowered and as consumer attention has be, been the, the topic of conversation. A lot of referral partners and, and realtors that I've talked to don't necessarily like working with a broker because to your point, if they're the local broker and the lender they're working with is in you know Michigan and the underwriters in Denver, then, then you don't have a lot of control on that. I, we, I work for an independent mortgage bank, so we do. I do get direct contact with the underwriters and the processors, and all those people work for our company, and a lot of independent mortgage banks operate that way. To, to more directly answer your question, I don't think we're ever gonna get to the time where there's one person making that decision, but what's happening is technology is allowing that we don't have to have people in certain parts of that, where right. you know the valuation, when an appraisal comes in, we may have an automated value that says, yep, that looks good, and flood certs, we have a bot that'll go out and pull the flood cert, and you don't have to have a human that spends time on that. Right. So whenever you know the, 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 the monetary side of the business, we can compress some of those costs so that we can offer that in terms of other marketing to our referral partners or commissions to our loan officers. That will happen, but te technology is never going to fully replace an on-the-ground professional. I think Silicon Valley is part, I'm going to say this very loosely, part of the problem in the sense of a lot of these big tech companies, you can't talk to somebody. You need something fixed. And I'm not talking on mortgage. I'm talking Airbnb. I'm yeah, talking yeah. these different companies. We deal with website hosting and stuff where you put in a ticket and somebody gets back to you with the help where you can't call in somebody in line. I actually think probably in a mortgage world where you may be talking about where you're talking about people all over the country, it's a similar thing. They put it in. It shows up on somebody's queue. Right. It's when they get to it. They didn't like that person. You call that person on the phone and be like, hey, man, I really need this like right. 10 minutes from now. Like. I don't think that's happening in some of these mortgage companies out there. And they get back to you with a script. So it's right. yeah. non-personal. They're probably not solving the issue. They're just doing what they've been told to do. And that's why you'll never be able to commoditize something like this, something like a, a real estate transaction. There, there's parts of it that you can streamline, but on a high level side of the industry, the other other reasons that there's not going to be a handful of companies that control it are because the internet is the great equalizer. Same way with social media. That's why we have indie brands in cosmetics and craft beer and even spirits. You have all of these independent brands that are getting traction because they have the internet and social media that's the great equalizer. So when you apply that to mortgage and real estate, typically or historically, excuse me, the name on your business card mattered because you had their resources and their reach behind you. Anymore, that doesn't mean as much for two reasons. One, those longstanding companies have been slow to adopt a lot of these things and they're almost behind now. And you have the smaller companies that have figured out a way to do it more efficiently for the individual loan officer or real estate professional on the ground. And I see on the real estate side too, and I can't speak as much to that, but you see these smaller companies that are exploding because they're making it all about the local professional. Mm -hmm. And that's what no national company and no tech company can ever compete against is the four of us having drinks, yep. talking about the industry, independent of a tech platform because those platforms don't want you to leave the platform to talk to a human where when we talk about branding and high level stuff and mortgage, we want to create all this attention and take it offline. That's that's the objective of what we want to do. See, I think, I, I think right to this point, in the real estate world, and you're sitting here in Myrtle Beach, I know Myrtle Beach is unique in the sense of, I don't think the buyers here, the people moving here, we're a growing area, constantly growing, um, are as franchise focused. And I know we've talked about this on previous episodes where it's not like, oh, I'm looking for a Remax agent. No, they're looking for that personal brand. Yeah. And so we have a lot of in independence or what I call quasi independence. They may be associated with franchise, but they're more known as their other brand than sure. they are the franchise. In this area, I see that a ton mm -hmm. um, playing into that where you're headed with the, hey, you don't have to have that big name brand behind you. And honestly, we mentioned it in mortgage side, we mentioned it before. I believe Zillow gave these small real estate agencies a chance to compete because a small real estate agent doesn't have the marketing budget of a Zillow. Right. They can't go buy the Google AdWords like mm -hmm. Zillow can. They can't go 
buy that. Now all of a sudden you're getting the benefit of some um, multi-billion dollar company behind you without you having to necessarily put their brand on your business card. Sure. And, and I think that's probably exactly what you're saying in the mortgage industry is right. happening. And that brings it back to you doing business with not a company, but yeah, an individual. With people. Yeah. So you build that relationship, mm -hmm. not the company. So whether you work for a Remax Century 21 Caldwell, uh, it doesn't matter if you're ABC Realty, it, mm -hmm. they trust you. Um, and, that, and that's why they choose to do business with you. Well, I was just going to speak. I, I guess one thing I'm, I'm interested in, in hearing your perspective, and we can all speak to it a little bit. And I, don't, I can't remember if we've done an episode like this or not, uh, or with this topic in it. But you're talking about, you know, there's so much that can be commoditized or streamlined within the mortgage process. So we can speak to a real estate process, use that a little interchangeably for this example. But, you know, how much Internet technology Where's the stop point where there, we? I think I heard you right. You, there will always probably need to be a relationship or human in the process. Mm -hmm. But how far? Like how 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 much can we get to Agreed. it being you know instead of a 30, 45 day closing, can technology or blockchain or whatever get us to a week and even well, in a mortgage process? But we still need a person. You know, like sure. where's, well, where Chris, are we going long term? I think, but I think it speaks to even more things. Not even at the technology, but it's also the lending atmosphere. Because yeah. back in, the, I mean, we used to be this 05, 06, mm -hmm. getting a loan. If the underwriting guidelines are weak, well, guess what? It's easy to turn the loan fast. Yeah, well, I mean, yes and no. And, yeah. and so a lot of times whenever it's easy to get loans or rates are low, then turn times actually increase because there's so much volume to be had. But, but to your point, yes, there's only so much of the process you can automate. So here is the thing that can't be replaced. Well, we keep, we keep saying over and over, the relationship, right. right? So if I, as a loan officer or a real estate professional, again, they're synonymous for, for what I'm saying. If I brand myself within the community and I own that market and people know who I am, it doesn't matter what the process or technology stack behind me is or the environment of the market, that's still where they're going to go because they feel comfortable with that. So if 90% of the process is automated, but they still want to go to a human being and I'm paid a fraction of what I was paid five years before, that's okay because you're going to make up for it in volume. Yep. Mm -hmm. So what I think is going to happen is as the market kind of corrects itself as we get through coronavirus, we get through election, we get through some of these things, what you'll find is people that are having to build different types of businesses. Information is a commodity. We all know that. So how do you curate information and present it in a way that's relevant to an individual person, whether it's uh, a referral partner that we're trying to get the attention of as a mortgage professional or whether we're all going to a consumer, they don't know what information to trust, to believe, to understand. So how do you curate that from all these different tech platforms? And, and the last part of that that I'll say is that historically a lot of big companies would develop proprietary software, proprietary systems. No one does that anymore because the amount of money that it costs to develop those types of things in today's day and age, you can go find an out of the box company to partner with. So you see this emergence in Silicon Valley of all these companies that are partnering with real estate and mortgage companies to provide these services for them. But then the downside is that everyone has access to it. And it's again, it comes back to what's your differentiating factor? What's your unique value proposition? So as I recruit and talk about our company, and there's a lot of other companies that are similar to ours, we talk about the three or four things that we can do for a loan officer that are going to allow them to do what they need to do for that local market. And again, the big banks and technology companies can't do that. Right. They just can't. Right. So we've been on, I'm going to say a long run. It's been a good market in the sense of yeah. growing. Rates have been falling since, really since 2007. Rates have been dropping in general. Where do you see, I mean, the market's got to turn at some point. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know that. It's, it's a cycle. cycle. It's a cycle. Yeah. So, so like young loan officers, young or even experienced ones, what advice are you giving them to prepare for, okay, volume might drop. Like, mm -hmm. And then, like you were saying, they've already squeezed down and made up on volume. You already talking about that. So yeah. now we've squeezed down our margin we're making by doing more loans, but all of a sudden now, we know during a recession, the number of loans drops. But we also have more competition because we have more people Agreed. in both industries. Agreed. Yeah. So two things. One, I'll go back to something we talked about in the previous episode, niche down. Mm -hmm. When you niche down, you secure your place within a market as opposed to people that are just trying to do anything and everything. They don't have a place. Think of, uh, if there's 
you know, what is what's that game uh, when the music stops? Uh, musical chairs. Musical chairs. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I have kids. kids. Yeah. 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 I got kids. So Chris does that. <laughs> imagine the market is a big game of musical chairs, and there's only so many chairs in each niche. If you don't sit down in a niche, when the music stops, you're not going to have a place. So niching down is extremely important. I like that analogy. Yeah. The, the other part of it is going to be stop selling rate. If I could say anything to mortgage professionals right now, it's that I believe salespeople in the mortgage industry, loan officers in the mortgage industry are lazier than ever before. Because the market's been good, because rates have historically been low for about a decade now, people walk in, they offer them some products, and people get a mortgage. Mm. I've said a lot of times, I would be okay, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna catch some hell for this, I would be okay if rates went up a, a decent amount, because then you filter out some of the, these people that are just there because rates are low. You have mm. career sales people that have been from industry to industry, and I think that, Whenever the cycle does change, whenever that is, however that happens, you have to be prepared for it. You have to understand that your value is above and beyond just what that interest rate or fees or turn time is. So again, if you've built a personal brand of someone that creates value, of someone that can, can take commoditized content and present it in a way that's relevant and you become relevant yourself, you insulate yourself from those things, especially if you, you pair the two, you build a brand around a niche, I mean, you know, not to pat myself on the back, that's all I've done in the mortgage industry. I reach out to mortgage professionals. I am a mortgage professional. I've niched down on the marketing side of things. And I've gotten a lot of credit because I put a microphone in front of people that had something to say about that topic. Mm -hmm. Had I done it differently, it, it would have worked out differently. Yeah. So Bill, you're probably the broker sitting here between the three of us that has the most niche. What, what do you, I mean, do you, do you feel like that can carry you through the next downturn? I think so. So between having an office in a resort setting, it kind of minimizes my expense as far as marketing and reaching out to people. Um, I've got 850 units that I, I manage and there's guests in every one of those are coming through my office and they're buying and new owners are coming and I'm building relationships with them. I sit on the board. They see me every day. I know most about the the development so they see me as the expert so that's why they're coming to me because I have the answers they can go out to somebody else and nine times out of ten they're calling me and relaying the information but yeah essentially um, it's kind of a, a built-in money hole <laughs> We joke that Bill won't show property outside of a three block radius. I tend to get into an elevator. I don't, I don't put people in my car. In fact, I don't put myself in a car. Um, within a couple blocks, we can walk on a nice day. But typically, I'm getting in an elevator and having that elevator speech up to the top. And the units sell themselves based on the view and the condition and everything else. I just provide them with the right information and. But you're you positioned yourself in that niche. Someone else mm -hmm. could do more work and not get the same results you have because Absolutely. they're not in that niche. And I think right. that's really what I like to illustrate with people. And I think there's something that just kind of came to me is, is the power of 100. I think we should probably trademark that power 100 something. Right here. Every, on that note. Everyone knows 100 people. I don't care if it's friends, family, you know, people you bump into. We all can, can, can wrap our mind around knowing 100 people. Each one of those hundred people also know a hundred people. So that's what jumped into my head is you're like, we have 850 units with tenants coming in, new ones, old ones, and the people that they know, that's 10 times the amount of people that you need to have a business perpetuate forever if you're doing the work. And that's where the laziness comes in. And I think, I don't want to speak for real estate professionals, but for you sure, more <laughs> than lazy. I think it's probably on the real estate side too. There's a lot of lazy people that don't want to send a handwritten note, send an email message, load people into a, you know, a, CRM. a CRM or Calls some type of a data monitoring where, yeah, you know, or pay attention to their Facebook feed. And so they're having a life event. Maybe I should reach out to them and see if they need anything, not for the purposes of doing a mortgage of, Hey, I saw that happen. Is there something that I can do for you? No. Um, but, but even the, even the salesy side, yeah, even the salesy, even the salesy side. side, no, but even the salesy side, what I sit there and say is I've hired two new agents recently. And I told them, I'm like, they're like, what's the first thing I should do? I said, go write down every person you know that if you heard they did business with somebody else other than you, you would be upset. Mm -hmm. Once you have that list, yeah. call every one of them so and let good. them know you're in real estate. Like, yep. to me, it's so simple. Neither of them did it. Yep. And then they're in my office saying, I don't got any deals going on. And I'm like, yeah. 
Dude, <laughs> see, rocket science. And it's so <laughs> funny. Before I got in the mortgage business, I did some network marketing stuff. And that's what they used to say. They said, listen, if you don't talk to your friends and family and try to sponsor them in this business, someone else will. And again, I'm not advocating for that business model. Or I'm not saying positive or negative. What I am saying is the concept applies to this. You have friends and family members that you can be talking about and educating about whatever your respective industry is. And if you don't, I promise you someone else is. And I have a whole group of people in my sphere of influence and they'll work for me that we're advocating daily. If you don't go talk to them, we will. I promise you. Because we're putting out content at scale yeah. and that's the message. Mm. 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 Yeah. I can see that. Tra- I mean, that translates really I mean, right over to real estate and, and, and mortgage. We're in the yeah, same boat. I think we're overinflated on people, doing it, else agents, will. and everything and too. I'll give a flip side to the coin. Um, there's a, a book called Seven Levels of Communication by Michael Mayer. And you guys may have read it. He's a, a, a realtor. And at the time he was doing business, he was called the most referred realtor in the country. He did like 350 or 400 transactions a year, 100% based upon referral. The company that they work for, and we probably all know, they do their lead generation time in the morning. <laughs> and what they did is instead of lead generation, they did what's called generosity generation. And their whole team would call everyone they knew in their database or you know, different groups of people and just say, hey, is there anything that you need? Is there something we can help you with? Does your grandma need to mow your, you know, can we mow your grandma's yard? Do you need movie reservations or, or dinner reservations? Or, you know, does someone need help moving? So it doesn't matter what it is. You think of all the things in life that if someone called and said, hey, do you need a body or two just to help you, how far that would go? And that's all they did during their lead generation time is actually actively help people. And they did it via phone, which is kind of an outdated way to do it now. Yeah. And he became the most referred realtor in the country by simply picking up the phone to people that he knew and acquaintances and say, can we help you? Right. Wow. Now, we can sit here and talk analytics on social media, tech platforms, podcasting, all these different things. Nothing can beat picking up a phone and calling another human and saying, is there something I can do for you? Mm-hmm. And I think we underestimate the value that that could be to our brand. So all the stuff we're talking about is great, but I don't want people to think, oh, well, that's tech stuff. I can't do that. Right. I came from a world of handing out flyers to realtors. I printed out map quests to figure out the offices to be the most efficient. And at the bottom, all it said was my name and phone number and available seven days a week. And I can't tell you the people that called me that said, because I could call you seven days a week, I picked up the phone and called you. We didn't have social media. I walked through realtor offices and the gatekeeper that you guys have is the front desk lady that doesn't let you back. Mm-hmm. After five or six days of doing this, when I first got started, she said, aren't you afraid that if you keep coming morning and afternoon, that people are going to think you're not doing any business? And I just said, if realtors are here morning and afternoon, they're not doing any business either. <laughs> and I just kept walking through. That's awesome. <laughs> so again, we don't, we don't have to overcomplicate this whole thing. Yeah. So to become a personal concierge and a loot to become a personal friend. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That's a Change great it. way to frame it. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, any one bold prediction for the mortgage industry next? Bold years? prediction? Kind of, I don't know if it's a bold out. prediction. Um, I, my, my prediction is rates are going to stay low in 2020, um, so we don't have to get in a, a rush. Rates don't go up and down in a straight line, don't get me wrong. But uh, I think rates are going to stay low. Um, 2020, we might see some shift happening. And... Uh, I think it's going to be business as usual, and it's going to be a great year for for people that are out there, as my dad says, making hay while the sun shines. So I got one other. I want to ask you to make one other prediction. (laughs) Uh prediction. Double prediction. And this is within the next five years. Where do you see consumer attention moving? Where do I see consumer attention moving? Mm -hmm. Um, Not even mortgages, just in general. You know, again, right now, consumer attention is solely on our mobile device. That's what I believe. And I'll challenge anybody to go to a restaurant, go to a public place and look around and see who's on their phones, number one. And the other thing that I'll tell you to do is that uh, when I speak at places, I have people raise your hand if you do uh, Netflix, Amazon Prime, DVR. If you can watch TV, if that how you do it, everybody raises their hand. I say, okay, now, if you happen to watch a commercial, like your dog ate your remote hole so you can't fast forward it or it's a live sporting event, what's the first thing you do? You pick up your phone, yep. right? That's where our attention is. And I think the attention is going to stay there um, for the foreseeable future. But I do like things like what you're doing with SoundUp. I do like uh, Amazon Alexa. I think that... Sorry. I'm having trouble understanding right now. <laughs> That's actually awesome. Yeah, I thought we changed <laughs> your mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's my point. <laughs> 
<laughs> if we're not paying attention, she is. Yeah. So wow. I do think just like the iPhone and Android was a platform and apps built on top of it, I do think that uh, the Alexa device is is a platform that we're going to be building business off of. And whether that's Google Home or, or that A word device <laughs> that Amazon made, or um, the I guess Facebook's trying to get into that too with the portal. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think those are going to be the new mobile devices going forward as far as our attention. Mm-hmm. Um, but I still think we're ways off. I still yeah. think we're a couple of years before that has you know hits critical mass and, and the you know the, the majority of the population. We we um, couldn't plan we couldn't that. script that. that. that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, we just know if you can plan that. That was good. All right, guys. Right. So we definitely want to thank Phil. I appreciate for taking the trip to Myrtle awesome. Beach to join us. It's a pleasure. Yep. Learned a lot. Yep. Did. And I'm sure he'll keep drinking. We'll be drinking. Stay classy. <laughs> you got a tagline. <laughs>